I'm just so glad to be back with you all and for us to be in a series together. The series that I've been teaching on has to do with the presence of God in some way or another because of some of the things that have been happening out here at Journey Church. I heard about it, where the Spirit of the Lord would come and you couldn't stop singing. You, you continued to minister before the Lord. And I think one Sunday it actually interrupted the preaching. Is that right? That, that is not to be a one-off. Uh, that is to be norm. And so as I sought the Lord in coming out to be with you all, he has given me some message. And every message that he has given to me in some way or another relates to his presence. Worship is not about singing songs. Worship is about his presence. And we sang about it this morning, and it's such a beautiful time. Can we just give the worship team and hope? I mean, I'm telling you, you all have, you all have got a treasure out here. And it's not because she was one of my favorite students. That's not it. That's, that's not it. That, that, that's not it. It's because, it's because there's an anointing that that girl carries that when she opens her mouth and sings, the presence comes. And so, so you all are blessed. I think sometimes people don't know how blessed they are until you go to another place and you don't have that. And you don't have to go to another place. I've come from some other places, and I can tell you. <laughs> she didn't pay me for that, but I'll be trying to collect some things. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking about this morning is cultivating an overflowing life. Cultivating an overflowing life. Would you stand with me and we're going to pray and then we'll go straight into the word. Father, we are so grateful to be yours. We're so grateful for songs that carry the message of our hearts. But we want to let you know that the song will never substitute be the message that is in our hearts for you the testimony of what you have done for us. We want to just say thank you for your rescue of our lives. Thank you for the defeat of the enemy. Thank you that you made an open show of him in the heavenly places. Thank you that you came to us who were chained. We were in the dungeon. We had graffiti walls all around us, and the enemy wanted to completely destroy us, and you said no. You said no, and you came to our rescue. And we thank you that you brought us out of the kingdom of darkness. You took darkness out of us, brought us into the kingdom of light of your dear son, and placed light on the inside of us. Now we're children of light, and we want to say thank you. We thank you for this morning that you are here already, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you will minister the word to our hearts. You will give us eyes to see and ears to hear as we open up our hearts to you, and you say, we say this, teach us, instruct us, show us wondrous things from your word is our prayer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Cultivating an overflowing life. Cultivating an overflowing life. You see, if we don't fill our hearts with what God wants us to fill our hearts with, we'll fill it with something. And so that's why he gives us instructions. God gives us instructions because he knows that we will fill our hearts and there will be an overflow that will happen in our lives. And so he directs us as far as what he wants to be the overflow in our lives. What Bible characters can you think of that you would say that they had an overflowing life or an overflowing heart? You might think of David when he wrote the Psalm, Psalm 23, and he said this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, 
and you anoint my, what? My head with oil, and my cup is filled, to the, is filled just to the brim. No, he said it's an overflowing. The Amplified says a brimming, brimming over. That is to give us that God in the most unlikeliest of situations, God wants to give us a heart regardless of what we're going through that overflows with his goodness, overflows with his love, overflows with his kindness. What other, what other character can we think of? In Psalm 45, Psalm 45 verse 1, this is another psalmist, and he says this, my heart overflows with a goodly thing. I address my psalm to a king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready writer. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I am ready at any given time to be able to speak out, and my heart is an overflow that will go into praise, into thanksgiving. What a beautiful song that we sang this morning about God being our protector. It, 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 I, I had to almost collect myself, so I said to the Lord, I said, you got to help me because I could be a puddle of tears. I'm one of those men that when I go to the movie with my wife to see one of her girly flicks, I'm the one who takes the tissue with me. <laughs> and I'm not ashamed of that. I used to keep it in. It didn't do me good. Have you noticed, men, that if you don't express it the right way, it will be expressed? And so I'm the one who takes the Kleenex, and occasionally she will ask for it, but I use most of them. <laughs> Let's then define overflow. Let's define overflow and discover together how to cultivate an overflowing heart and life. The definition of overflow is when the volume of a substance exceeds the capacity of its intended container. Let me say it again. It is when the volume of a substance exceeds the capacity of its intended container. This definition brings us to what Jesus was speaking about in John chapter 15, when he was talking with his disciples and he told them that he desired an intimate relationship with them and that he wanted them to stay connected, intimately connected to the vine, that he was the true vine, they were the branches. And then he spoke of them abiding with him and he with them so that in such union they would bear much fruit. Not just bear fruit, but bear much fruit. Say that, much fruit. What Jesus is after is that he brings us out to bring us into, but it's always for purpose. It's never that he does anything that does not have purpose. And the purpose is that each of our lives would bear much fruit. We're going to bear something. What God says, I want your life to bear much fruit. Well, then how do we go about to do that? Let me give you the definition of fruit. Definition of fruit. And this is going to be helpful for us to know how to cultivate an overflowing heart and life. Fruit is excess water excess life, excess water, excess life. Say that with me. Excess water, excess life. Yeah. Fruit, that's it. You see, when a tree has received through its root system water and nutrients and has filled the roots, the trunk, the limbs, and the, and the leaves, 
and it has nowhere else to go, and it's completely saturated, the only thing that that tree can now do is bear fruit. You have never, we, when we lived out in California for a number of years, and people would have all kinds of fruit trees in their yards. We had, when we lived on a street in, in Pasadena, we had uh, an avocado tree. I don't like avocados. But I didn't know that there were a lot of people who love avocados. And this tree would bear beautiful, big avocados. And we, not knowing the value, allowed those avocados just to fall to the ground. What a waste. What a waste. I didn't know that I could have sold them for a dollar a piece. <laughs> but what happened is, is that in the backyard, we did water the trees. And so when water would go into every part of that tree, every part of the system of that tree, it had no, no one had to go out and say, oh, avocado, oh, avocado tree, bear, 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 avocado. I command you in the name of Jesus, bear fruit. No one had to do that. All you had to do was water it, fertilize it, cultivate it, and by the very fact of that, it bore fruit. Let's see by examination some various types of fruit if this is true by looking at the content and the percentage of water in each. Oranges, 60, no, 87% water. Apples, 84% water. Peaches, 88% water. If I name one of your favorite, I don't mind you waving your hand. Make sure that you're still out there. Watermelon, 92% water. Cantaloupe, 90% water. Grapefruit, 91% water. Tomato, 93% water. Wow. If you can't say amen, you can say wow. <laughs> First the natural, then the spiritual. If through proper irrigation of water and nutrients that a fruit tree bears fruit, then what do we as believers need as a continual watering to bear much fruit in Christ? The psalmist gives us a clue. In Psalm 1, the beginning of the Psalms, he said this, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law, and upon his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by rivers, rivers, say rivers, not one river. I would have been happy for one river. But your God and my God wants to give us rivers. Jesus speaking in John chapter 4. He's talking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And he says, from out from your belly shall flow rivers, rivers of living water. Wow. That's the abundant and the extravagant nature of our God is that he wants to give us more than enough, more than enough. He wants to give us to the overflow. Why? Is it just for you? No. He's got something else in mind. But he knows that he needs to fill you and I first before we can then be useful to him in his kingdom. If you and I only have enough for us, then we're not yet ready to be used by the king. It's got to be the overflow. 
It's got to happen in the overflow. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that yields forth its fruit in its season, and his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Wow. There are two things that are available to every believer for them to have an overflowing heart and life. The first is the Spirit of God. And the second is the Word of God. And you can have unlimited supply. It's the only place in Scripture that we are given that we can be gluttons. You can ask for the Holy Spirit to fill you afresh and anew and to the overflow, and you can, hear me, I'm not talking about when you come to the Word of God, the psalm, a proverb, an Old Testament, and a new. How many of you know that program? I know that one. I was on a reading program, and that's like a snack. One Old Testament, one new, one proverb, one psalm. And then I felt like I had done my duty until God started challenging me and he said, I want you to be a glutton when it comes to the word. I want you to put it in, put it in. And I said, but Lord, what am I going to? He said, whenever I need it, I'm going to bring it out of you. But I want you to put it in because you don't know where I'm going to bring it out of you and where I'm going to use it, and what circumstance with what person or what people, so I want you to just put it in. Put it in, I'll bring it out. You put it in, I'll bring it out. Turn in your devices to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And it says this, it says this, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Have you noticed in the scripture that God always tells us what not to do, but he never leaves us at the not to. He'll tell us to take something off, and then he'll tell us to put something on. He'll tell us to come out of something, but then he'll tell us to go into. And so here, Paul is giving instructions by the Spirit, and he's saying this. He's saying, don't get drunk with wine wherein is excess. But be filled. When you look at the definition of, of that, it's not just be filled, it's be being filled. Be being filled. Be being filled. Why? Why would Paul give such instruction? It's because he knows that in daily life, we are be being poured out, be being poured out so that you need to be being filled. How many of you have ever been in a situation that you're talking or ministering to someone and you find that at the end of it, you've been drained? Then you need to be being filled. You need to be being filled as many times as you feel you are being, being drained. <laughs> are you here? Hello. How many of you filled your gas tank this week? Okay, if you didn't, you will, right? <laughs> Unless you have an electric car. And then still you're going to have to plug that in. Because we haven't found yet any car that once you have filled it once, you don't have to fill it again. Do you know something I don't know? 
Because if you've got that car, let's get together after the end of this meeting. We can make some... <laughs> no, it doesn't exist. I remember, and I played this game, and my wife didn't like playing this game. And I would see how low can I go. <laughs> and she would go, I don't like this game. And she said, if we run out, I'm not walking with you. I'm not going to walk with you. And so then when I would do, I would play this game of how low can you go. And so I would see the needle going down towards the E, and I wanted to see, well, just how long can I go when it hits the E so that I can know if it ever happens that I've still got a little left. <laughs> how many of you know what I'm talking about? I don't, like, I don't like playing that game anymore because I don't like walking that long distance. But, but when you did get to the, to, to the service station and you take off the lid, it would do what? And it's on fumes. How can you and I as believers know that we're running on fumes? How can we know? How can we know that we need a refilling? We need to be being filled again. Let me tell you how you can know. When strife appears, when there's strife, there's dissension, petty arguments. <laughs> Complaining. Everything. Every, nothing's right. No, nothing's right. Nothing, nothing's gone right today. Nothing. Well, you got, you got up. Well, I, I got up, but everything's wrong. You need to be being filled. That's, that's a, it's an indication. It, on the dashboard of your soul, it's a blinking yellow light. And it's saying, almost empty. And when you take it off, it's going... No, can't give thanks. Nothing to give thanks about. Nothing. Grumble, 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 mumble, mumble, mumble. Ugh. That, those are indicators on the dashboard of your soul that you need to be being filled. You could name some others, couldn't you? What are some others? Come on, call it out. When do you know you need it? Hmm? Depressed. Mm -hmm. Ir irritated, irritable, don't even know why. I just, every time I look at you, I just get irritated. <laughs> and not only that, when you look at me, I get irritated. <laughs> just the way you look, I see that look, that's the way, that's the way. I see the look. What, what, what do you mean? I'm interpreter. You didn't know that I was interpreter of looks now, did you? <laughs> there are people who can interpret tongues. I can interpret looks. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You need to be being filled. Your tank is low. So that if we are being poured out, we need to be being filled. In the Amplified, it says this, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but ever be filled and stimulated with the Holy Spirit. Speak out to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, offering praise with voices and instruments, and make a melody in all your heart to the Lord. As drinking wine frees you from your inhibitions, so being filled with the Holy Spirit frees you from self-consciousness and from fears and from worry. You want me to read it again? Listen to this. As drinking wine frees you from inhibitions, so being filled with the Holy Spirit frees you from self-consciousness and fears and worries and anxiety. As being inebriated with wine frees your speech, 
So being filled with the Holy Spirit frees you to speak out and to sing out to one another without any sense of consciousness to your voice or your breath. I always say breath because many times we're concerned that if I sing to somebody, do I have, is my breath all right? Well, when you're filled with the Spirit, you don't, you get past all of that. You get, you do. You, you do. I had an uncle, his name was Uncle Eddie. Uncle Eddie was a shy man, kind-hearted, sweet-hearted man. And on Fridays when he got his paycheck, he would go to the corner bar and he would stay there all night. And you wouldn't have even recognized Uncle Eddie when he came out of the bar at a one o'clock in the morning. He's going down the street and he's singing to the top of his voice. You didn't even know Uncle Eddie could sing. And Uncle Eddie is, I mean, he is, I love Lucy. <laughs> She's my gal. <laughs> and another thing about Uncle Eddie was that when he was drunk, he was generous. So he would give all of his money away. And then on the next day, when he was sobering up, he was trying to remember who he gave it to so he could go back and collect it. <laughs> it never worked. It never worked. What does this have to do with being filled with the Spirit? What does this have to do with being filled with wine or with other, and I like here in Memphis, Memphis calls places that you can get wine and and uh, vodka and, and Jack Daniels and all kinds of other stuff. They call it spirits. And I think that that is aptly named. It's just the wrong kind. But, but what, what you'll discover is in Acts chapter 2, when the disciples who have waited and they are filled with the Holy Spirit, those who observed it thought that they were drunk. There is a correlation. In the natural, that's why Paul is saying, stay away from the wrong spirit, but fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. Because what he will do is much better for you and for those around you. You are freed when you are filled with the Spirit to sing your praise to God. You are freed not only to sing your praise, but in the context also of edifying your brothers and your sisters. One of the things, hope, one of the things that I have noticed is that we do not have many songs in our repertoire for the, for the saints of God to sing to one another. Because that is where Paul is talking. It's in the context of worship that we sing out to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There is something that singing to one another does that just singing straight up to the Lord does not do. And we are to encourage and edify. We are to even admonish one another in song. Admonish is a strong word. It's a very strong word. But God in his ingeniousness, he puts it in a song where if it was not in a song, we would get all, huh. You know what it means to admonish one another? Brother, what's your name? Cal. Cal? Come here, Cal. This is what admonish. I've been, I've been looking at Cal. This is hypothetical. And Cal, Cal has been walking with the Lord for a number of years, and I start seeing some deviant behavior. And so as a brother, I come up to Cal, and I have a relationship with him, and I begin to speak to Cal, and I say, Cal, what's going on, man? Um, I don't know. Cal, listen, you got a wife, you got a baby at home. This baby that I've been seeing in you, this has got to stop, brother. We can't continue this way. This does not even help you uh, in your marriage. It does not help you in, in your walk with the Lord. And, and I want you to walk worthy. This admonishing this. Man, I, listen, listen. I want, no, don't, you, don't you be smiling at me right now, Cal. You, I, 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 
Admonish is strong. We admonish one another. But you got to have a relationship. You got to have a relationship. I'm going to put that on. I'm going to say it again. You got to have a relationship. I just can't come up to Cal Cal go, hmm, who are you? <laughs> Talking to me like that. First of all, he won't even hear me because he's going, hmm. And then he'll go home and tell his wife later on what I said. This man, I don't know who he was. About five, seven and a half or something, but whew, whew, everything in me I had to hold back. I wanted to bless him with a brick. And I, listen, I wanted to lay hands on him without prayer. Oh, whew. No, admonish is a strong word, but you know what God does? God says, I want you to sing it to one another. Do you know what? As we sing and admonish one another, no walls go up. We'll stay vulnerable to each other. And the word then goes in rather than us rejecting it. Cal, thanks. You all give Cal a... Uh, Here are a few other ways that we can know that we're saturated with the Spirit. When we sing, we sing out loudly. We sing out loudly. Let me tell you something, Journey. You are to sing in such a fashion that you will overpower the team up here. Your goal, your goal as a church is that you, the many, will overtake the few. That they'll have to go, hmm, wow. It's not to provoke them to get louder. It is so that you become the loudest ones in the room. In singing out and speaking out your praise to the Lord, you overtake them. And they hear you. That's the goal. And you do it loudly. Loudly, not because you're trying to make a show. It's because you're making a show over him who saved you. And you are, you are making sure that your voice is being lifted up. And in the heavenly realm, God recognizes every voice. You say, brother, you don't know my voice. You don't know I... I couldn't carry a tune if it was in the radio. It's not a matter of the quality of your voice. It's the fact of your heart that is so, so excited and so exuberant over what he has done. You want to let him know. I think you all have heard me say this before, but it's worthy of saying again. I've seen on television, just like you, guys that are in cold, cold weather, of which I cannot stand, are bare-chested, and they have big old letters on their chest, and they're cheering every time their team makes a point. I'll never allow any game for me to cheer more at a baseball or a football or any other game, outdo me in my praise of God. I will not let it happen. I will not let it happen. I will let him who has redeemed me, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I'll make a show over him. I, and hey, I'm not worried about let, let me tell you something. Let me give you a secret that might free you. Your neighbor is not thinking about you. <laughs> you are thinking a little bit too much of you when you think that your neighbor is thinking about you. Your neighbor is thinking about them. But since you thought that your neighbor was thinking about you, now you've got to deal with it. Isn't that something? Your neighbor will go, child, I wasn't even thinking about you. Well, I thought you were. I thought I'd lose my reputation if I got out there and did what the Lord told me to do. <laughs> well, it wasn't to me anyway. It was to him, right? Yeah, should have been. Look, if you are afraid of what your neighbor is thinking, usually your neighbor is not even thinking about you. They're thinking about, did I turn that, did I turn the oven off? Did, boy, I hope I did. I wanted that roast done, but not fried. 
Oh, oh man. <laughs> the body is freed from fear of man when you are filled with the Spirit of God. You are out of that. You, you, you lose all sense of what anybody else thinks. You lose all self-consciousness, and you're into God consciousness. You're into helping others. You're into doing what you can. You are free. Here's, here's the other thing, and I'm not going to stay on this long because I'll emphasize it hopefully again on a Wednesday night. But Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You don't pray for these things. You don't pray for them. You are being filled with the Holy Spirit, and he produces this in us. How many of you have ever prayed for patience and you wished you hadn't? You go, what was I thinking? That means that I'm going to get more hurdles to go through. Oh, my goodness. You don't pray for patience. You allow the Spirit of God who is in you to be patient. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep on and keep in step with the Spirit. Thus, thus, what we will do is we will grow in spirit, both in character and in charisma. That's what God is wanting. He wants us to grow both in character and in charisma. Can I have, um, can I have three, three people to come up here real quick, and I'm going to use you as an illustration. I promise it will... It will not embarrass you. Come on, quickly. Three people, three. And if more than three show up, that's fine. Cal, thanks. Man, this Cal, Cal still loves me after using that, after being admonished. Come on, come on. This is important. This is important to be filled with the Spirit because in, when you came this morning, you came this morning, the Spirit of the Lord had already preceded you to this place. Because he knew where you were going to be, he wanted to be here with you. Never to leave, never to forsake. But bigger than that, he's in you and I, and so we bring him with us to whatever place we are at. And so what, what Paul is admonishing the church in, in uh, Galatia is, I want you to keep your relationships clear with one another. Why? Because when the Spirit of God does come in the room and his manifest presence is being manifest amongst us, he does not want fractured wiring, short-circuited wiring. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about relationships that are broken, relationships because of strife, because of relationship things that you have not repaired properly, unforgiveness. God wants those things completely repaired when you and I gather together. Why? So that the Spirit of God moves in power and manifests in power as we meet together. And if you have ever been in a building where there's faulty wiring, it's kind of, you know, you don't want to touch the wrong thing. And so what he wants, what he wants is, brothers, brothers, come put, 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 eat, put your, yeah, there you go. And turn around to the body so they can see you. <laughs> see, look, 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 can they, can they still see me if I'm down here? Look, look what happened. In the scripture it says this. It says, you are on your way to the altar and there with your gift and you you remember that someone has ought against you. I used to read that I had ought against someone else. That's not what it says. The scripture says you remember somebody has an ought against you. The scripture says leave your gift at the altar, go and make that situation right, then come back and there offer your, your gift before the altar and now it becomes acceptable. 
Why would the scripture, why would that be in there? It's because in a corporate body like us, and we want the manifest presence. How many of you want the manifest presence of God to visit you, not occasionally, but where the manifest presence of God rests when you come together here at Journey Church? How many of you want that? It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you your pride. It's going to cost you how you think that somebody thinks about you. It's going to cost you. You're going to be on your knees in prayer. It's going to cost you that no one will need to say, now, come on, say, so, lift your voices. Lift your voices. Your voice will already be lifted. You don't need to be exhorted. You've got a praise in you. You've got a testimony in you. You've got something that nobody else has of what he has done for you. You don't need somebody else to tell you. Oh, let me smile. So you know I'm not angry. You've got something that no one else has. And this, when you repair that and you come in repaired and everything is is in peace and in unity. The Holy Spirit told me this morning as I was preparing, he said, I do not pour my spirit upon dissension, upon strife, upon arguments, upon petty disagreements. That's not where my spirit dwells. My spirit dwells in unity. Thank you all. Well, what is the second thing? The second thing is found in Colossians chapter 3, 16. We are to be filled with the Spirit. But what is the second thing? We are to be filled with the Word of God. It says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So according to the scripture, we are to let the word of Christ dwell richly in our lives. Let means to allow, to permit, to grant the right to. Thus, we are to allow, permit, and grant the word of Christ to have its proper place in our lives. Here's how we can know we are filled to the overflow of the word of God. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. And we're going to start with verse 18. It says this, Therefore you shall lay up these, my words, in your minds and hearts and in your entire being and bind them for a sign upon your hands and as foreheads bonds between your, your eyes. And you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall write them upon the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Why? That your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. What, what he's talking about here is a form of meditation, a form of meditation. Did you know that singing songs is a form of meditation? Because you go over it and over it and over it and over it and over it. And in fact, songs help us to go longer than if we were just saying it. Because of the music, because of the harmony, because of the accompaniment, we allow ourselves to go over it more than once. It's a form of meditation. And so the scripture here is telling us how we are to treat the word. How many of you have talked and talked and talked and you find that nothing has changed? You talk and you talk. You call your best friend and you talk to your best friend and it's still the same. Maybe we're talking to the wrong people. Maybe we need to switch the audience and start talking more to God and talking to the Word according to what the Word is saying. I'm a strong believer in prayer, but I'm also a strong believer 
in aligning my prayers to the word of God so that I'm not asking for something that God says, I can't give that to you. So I need to align my words to the will. He said, ask what you will in my name according to my name. That means you've got to align your prayers. My wife and I, my, my daughter Christina, she's with the Lord now. And we were praying, I think, how old was she, honey? Jimmy Lewis Bay. Eight or nine. Jimmy Lewis Bay was a boy at her elementary school, and he liked her, but he had a screwy way of showing it by bumping her over the head with a book. And he did it every day. And so she was going, I, I got to have relief from this. So we went to the principal, talked to the principal. We talked to the assistant principal. We talked to the counselor. So one day we gathered together and we prayed. And Christina held my hand, Martha's, and we prayed. And we prayed these beautiful prayers. And at the end, when we were about ready to close out, and Christina said, and Lord, if none of these work, kill him. So we had to instruct her in a better way. Uh, <coughs> she was basically saying, Lord, I'm tired of this. Take him out. Um, so we have to align our prayers to the word of God. And this, this, is, what, this is what Deuteronomy chapter 11 is saying. It says, when you sit in your house, talk about the word. When you walk along the road, talk about the word. When you lie down, talk about the word. When you rise up, talk about the word. When you, when you are eating, talk about the word. When you're cleaning up, talk about the word. When you're washing up, talk about the word. Talk about the word. Talk about the, talk about the word. Sometimes we're doing talking, but we're not talking about the right thing. When you begin to align you align yourself with what God is saying about you. When you are speaking what God is speaking over you, when you are saying to yourself what God is saying to you, things begin to happen. Things change. Many times it doesn't change because he can't bless the mess. When you sit down, I want you to say, talk about the word. Ready? When you sit down, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you rise up, when you sit down to eat, when you get up to clean up, when you're ready to put the kids to bed, when you're ready to wake them up, talk about the word, talk about the, talk about the word. Whatever you're full of is what you're going to talk about. God says, I want you to fill yourself up with my word. The word of God, when you begin to do that and you begin to fill yourself, I'm talking about not one psalm, not one proverb, but I'm talking about where you are actually filling and gorging yourself upon the word of God. You cannot contain it. You will not be able to contain it. Some of you in this room who are writers, will, you will begin to write plays and musicals. Some of you who are other writers, you'll begin to write uh, things of, of poems and, and prose. And some of you will begin to write short stories. Some of you will begin to write songs. Some of you will begin to do all kinds of things. Why? Because when you put the word of God in, it, its power will begin to work itself out in all kinds of creative ways. When you pray for your kids, the word that has been filled in you, it will begin to flow out of you. And you'll find answer. You'll find God is answering you. In closing, in closing, I want to read a prayer I, I was going to pray for you, and I felt like the Lord said, I want you to pray this over the people at Journey. That you want, he wants us to become a body, individually and corporately, 
that's filled with him, filled with his fullness. In so doing, what's going to happen is he wants you and I to be so filled that we splish splash over everybody that we meet. And we bless them. They, they don't even know. They walk, they walk away going, whoa, what did I just encounter? You just encountered a little territory that God owns. <laughs> you, you, you just came into presence of, not, not just John, not just Bill, you came into the presence of the living God. When you come together, when you are filled with the Spirit of God, you're filled with the Word of God, no one will be able to have to give you an exhortation. You will be speaking out. You'll be flowing in. You'll be like a river, like rivers in here. And, and the unbeliever, not only here in Journey Church, but wherever you go, Wherever you encounter, you encounter people, God will give you words while you're standing in line. God will start doing things all over the place. And that's what the body is supposed to be doing. How many of you know in the times that we live in now, people are more desperate than ever? People in, I don't know about what's happening out here in Militant, but let me tell you what's happening in places that we live. We are seeing accidents upon accident upon accident. And I'm not talking about little fender benders. I'm talking about stuff that you go, how did that happen? Where cars are being turned over. People are doing crazy stuff. Driving like they're going to a speedway. And it's like my mama said. We were on, I think it was like a, a road here. And it was two lanes. I was driving. This guy kept trying to get around me and couldn't get around me. And then finally, he got around me, sped up. And then we came. There was a, a red light. He was right there. We pulled up. And so my mama looked over at me. She looked at him. She looked over at me. And she said, hmm, he hurried to wait. I said, mama, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. He hurried to wait, going nowhere. God wants to use you, not just in the gathering, but when you come together, it's so energized. It's so manifest with his presence that any sickness, anything that is going awry will be healed. It will be done away with. Answers and questions that you come with, you will find answers to. You will find there is a deliverance. There is a breaking of a chain. There is something that's happening. Why? Because wherever his presence is, you cannot come in and walk out the same. Would you stand? In Philippians, in Philippians, this is the prayer. Could you, could you just close your eyes? Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, and I'm going to read this prayer. This is my prayer. I don't, I don't think I could say it any better than Paul and what he said. He said this, for this reason, seeing the greatness of this plan by which you are built together in Christ, I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that Father from whom all fatherhood takes its title and derives its name. May he grant you, out of the rich treasury of his glory, to be strengthened, and reinforced with mighty power in the inner man by the Holy Spirit himself, indwelling your innermost being and personality. May Christ, through your faith, actually dwell, settle down, abide, make his permanent home in your hearts. May you be rooted deep in love, and founded securely on love. 
that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints, God's devoted people, the experience of that love, what is the breadth and length and height and depth of it, that you may really come to know practically through experience for yourself the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, and that you may be filled through all your being unto all the fullness of God and may have the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. Now to him who by in consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So be it. Journey, I want to say again, as I said at the beginning, what happened for two Sundays that I was aware of, and it could be more, that the presence of God dwelt in this room and you were caught up with him is not a one-off. It's not to be a one-off. Whenever the saints of God dwell and gather together, and you come in filled. This week, ask the Holy Spirit, fill me afresh and anew as many times as you need it. When the, when the, when the, when the children are irritating you, stop and say, Holy Spirit, fill me afresh and anew. When you can't find what you're looking for, ask the Holy Spirit. You know where I've placed them. Help. Help me. And this week, gorge yourself. Take time on your lunch while you're eating a sandwich. Take time and read and just read and put it in. Don't worry about what you don't understand. Just put it in. And let him who is asking you to put it in, he'll bring it out when he knows it's time. He'll strengthen you. You will be strengthened. You will be built up. You will be encouraged. You will be filled. You will have answer. You will put things in that God will bring out, and it will be the answer to what you've been looking for. It's for you. It's for us. He wants to pour and pour it out upon you. How many of you are in? Amen. Would you raise your hand? Father, ask him now, fill me afresh. Fill me afresh and new with your spirit. Open up every door. Open up every window. Open up every crimp. Open up everything. And at the same time, throw out anything that you know that's hindering. Any thought of him, any thought that is not who he is, let that be gone. And ask him, fill me. Fill me. I need to be filled with your presence.